In the last 25 years, we've discovered over 4,000 exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars. New exoplanet discoveries have become normal, even routine, so much so that they rarely even make the news anymore. And yet, as wonderful as these discoveries are, planets are just one part of the equation that describes a solar system. For example, in our own solar system, there are eight planets, but a staggering 205 moons around those eight worlds. In fact, if you add up the surface area of all of those moons, it's almost three times greater than the land area of the Earth. An enormous amount of interplanetary real estate for our descendants to explore. And these moons are truly fascinating, from the volcanic flows of Io to the plumes of Enceladus, from the liquid ethane lakes of Titan to the subsurface ocean of Europa. These moons have a unique ability to excite our imagination and spark scientific curiosity. And so it's tantalizing to dream about possible moons around the 4,000 exoplanets discovered thus far. What treasures they must hold. How strange and wonderful many of them surely are. How spectacular the secrets of these small worlds could be. Yet these dreams remain firmly hidden from realization, because despite a decade of effort trying to look for these things, we still don't have a catalogue of exomoons. They have been persistently elusive. In fact, to date we only know of just one exomoon candidate, an object that we found in my team called Kepler 1625bi. To be real with you, I sometimes feel like I'm somehow personally responsible for this failure, at least in part. A decade ago, I wrote my PhD thesis on the topic of exomoons, where I devised methods to detect them in future missions. And the idea was really quite simple. If a planet has a moon around it, then that moon should gravitationally tug on the planet and cause it to wobble about in space. For planets which eclipse their star, so-called transiting planets, these wobbles will cause the timing of these transit events to apparently vary. So for example, if an alien watched the Earth transit in front of the Sun, the transit would be expected to occur once every 365 days. But the Moon actually causes the Earth to sometimes transit two and a half minutes too early, and other times two and a half minutes too late. And so, using those variations, an alien could figure out that the Earth has a Moon. These transit timing variations, or TTVs, emerge as an exciting path forward for detecting exomoons. Yet more, these wobbling planets not only cause TTVs, but also the wobbles cause the speed of the planet to change and thus the duration of the transits to vary, giving us transit duration variations, or TDVs. So after finishing my thesis, I have to admit to being pretty optimistic that the combination, the fusion of these two techniques, TTVs and TDVs together, would really solve the exomoon problem and give us many detections. This optimism was heightened by the launch of NASA's Kepler Space Telescope around the same time, which I predicted would be capable of detecting Mars mass exomoons using these techniques. Things looked great. I even launched a project to search for them called the Hunt for Exomoons with Kepler. Exomoons uh, will be playing an increasing role in our study of planetary systems in the future. I think we will discover potentially hundreds of exomoons in the future. Now, exomoons 
was pretty niche as a field and you know still is there really was just me and a few others thinking about how to detect them and so I sometimes wonder, was my enthusiasm and optimism for how many detections we might find somehow off-putting for new people thinking about joining the field? They might reasonably think, you know, if Kipping is going to detect all of these moons, what's the point in me trying to join it? He's just going to find them all, I won't be able to get any. And that's definitely not desirable, because no field benefits from a monopoly. Everyone makes mistakes and misses things, certainly me included. And so the more eyes we have on the prize to try and look for these things, the better our chances for success. But the fact is that there really weren't any of the teams apart from us who were doing a systematic survey for exomoons. And so when we failed to come up with a catalogue of these things, I think it really kicks the wind out of the sails of this emerging field. And once Kepler was done, it is now no longer functioning and taking data, I can totally understand why many of us might have pessimism about the future of exomoon hunting. I think what we need are new ideas, new thoughts and approaches, going back to the original theory, dusting it off and seeing if there are ways to improve it to give us the best chance possible to find these exomoons at last. And I'm certainly hoping that other people will join that effort, but you know, I'm taking some responsibility for this myself and going back to some of those original papers and seeing if there are things we can do to improve our chances. So what went wrong? Why is it that Kepler didn't find a bunch of moons? One effect surely coming into play here is that most of the Kepler planets that were discovered orbit their stars in very tight orbits, much closer than Mercury orbits the Sun even. That's certainly not good for moons, but there's still plenty of planets found further out where it is a little bit more surprising that we haven't seen anything. And in our exomoon survey, we specifically focused on those cooler, longer period worlds, hence the name of our team and this YouTube channel, The Cool Worlds Lab. But even amongst these cool worlds, we don't seem to have found an abundance of exomoons. In fact, the only one we have is this one exomoon candidate. So why? Remember what I told you earlier, one of the principal ways proposed to look for exomoons is TTVs, transit timing variations, wobbling planets. Now soon after Kepler launched, it didn't take long for it to find these TTV effects. In fact, Kepler found a lot of them, hundreds of systems exhibiting TTVs, a veritable gold mine of exomoons. But we soon realized that many of these TTVs were very clearly caused by planet-planet interactions and not planet-moon interactions. This wasn't that surprising. After all, Neptune in our own solar system was discovered by seeing Uranus wobble around in space all the way back in the 19th century. And don't get me wrong, these planetary interactions have been wonderful for learning about planetary masses and architectures. But the sheer volume of these things poses a major problem to those of us like myself who are interested in looking for exomoons. How can we tell whether the wobbles that we see are due to a planet or due to a moon? It's a bit like trying to detect a small faint LED light residing within a field of flashlights. The signal's there, it's just buried under a wave of spurious effects. One way we can distinguish between planets and moons is to run a detailed computer simulation of the two hypotheses and see which one of them most closely matches the data that we have. And that has largely been the strategy that we have used in the last five years. Unfortunately, it is simply very inefficient to do this. To give you some context, if I take just one of these 4,000 exoplanets and run the moon simulations on my desktop computer, it can take months or even years for the simulation to finish. 
There are billions of possible moon configurations to try. To speed this up, we use NASA's Pleiades supercomputer, which actually appeared in the movie The Martian, although we don't log into the computer by physically rocking up at the data center as in the movie. And so this takes time, and not just supercomputer time, but our own human time as well, to look through the results of these simulations and interpret what we have. And so, in the last five years, we have been limited by human manpower, computational resources, that we have only really been able to look through about 50 or so exoplanets with these detailed moon simulations. What we need are faster methods, techniques which can very quickly discern what is worth looking at and what is maybe more valuable to spend that precious computer time on. Enter our new paper entitled Impossible Moons. Okay, what am I talking about here? Our new paper really looks at the landscape of all of these TTV planets and just asks right off the bat, can we throw out some of these planets as being potential moons? Is there a subset of these for which we can say with great confidence, there is no way that an exomoon could possibly produce the signal that we are looking at? To do this, we really dust off those original equations from my PhD thesis and plug in extreme parameters. Parameters so extreme that they're impossible. So, for example, the TTV effect gets larger when the moon is further away from the planet. It's really just the law of pivots. So the further out the moon is, the more leverage it has to jerk the planet around. But moons have a very well-defined limit for how far away they can be, called the hill radius. If you put a moon any further out than this, then the gravity of the sun would destabilize the orbit, and so you'd actually lose the moon. So let's put our impossible moon just beyond this threshold. And second, let's make that moon as heavy as it could possibly be, because the heavier the moon, then the greater its gravitational influence on the planet. And so, almost by definition, we can say that the heaviest moon possible is one which has the same mass as the planet. That's because if you make the moon any heavier than the planet, then the moon really becomes the planet, and the planet becomes the moon, and so the ratio of the masses is still less than one. And so putting these together allows us to calculate an upper limit, a ceiling for how big these TTV effects could possibly be due to an exomoon. It varies from planet to planet, but it's typically of order of hours. And remarkably, many of the real Kepler planets have TTVs above this level. In other words, they are impossible moons. And so when it comes to moon hunting, we can just throw these guys out. There's no point even considering them. This diagram from the paper shows what I'm talking about. Here are 2,416 planets discovered by Kepler for which we observe TTVs. For each planet, we can use this logic to calculate a minimum possible orbital distance of a hypothetical moon. So, if these planets have a moon, then that moon would have to be at least this far away to explain the TTVs that we see. You'll notice that I've divided the orbital distance here by the planet's hill radius, so it's easy to see how feasible a moon really would be. The red points represent systems which are right up against this hill radius, or even beyond it, whereas the black points are comfortably inside. Adding these up, we find 179 of the Kepler planets can be flat out rejected as possible moons. Now that's assuming a maximum allowed distance of one hill radius, but it turns out that only retrograde moons can be stable beyond half a hill radius. Moons like those around Jupiter and our own moon are all prograde. That means they orbit the same direction around the planet that the planet orbits around the star. If we impose the extra condition that only prograde moons are allowed, then this ends up killing nearly 500 of the planets. Our paper introduces a second technique for killing moons as well. Now remember that moons should cause both a TTV and a TDV. So if you have a system which shows a TTV and you don't see a TDV, 
that's immediately suspicious for the moon hypothesis, and in fact you can use it to completely rule out an exomoon. Sadly, only 708 Kepler planets have TDVs available right now, but using those we can reject another 40 planets as being impossible moons. What's neat is that there's almost no overlap with the moons that we killed using the previous technique. So using these two strategies together and using maybe the more conservative assumption that only prograde moons are allowed, this actually ends up killing nearly 30% of all of these Kepler planets as being possible moons. I'm kind of happy with that number. It's enough that it will kind of make it more efficient for our future searches, but not too big that it's removing a vast swath of all of the possible exomoons out there. What's attractive about these impossible moon tricks is that it really doesn't require hours of computer time. Within just a few seconds, we can eliminate many planets and direct our resources more efficiently to where it's needed. So what's next? Well, we've already started using this in our own exomoon hunting surveys, along with another even more powerful development that I will tell you about in a future video. Together, these two developments really represent the first significant improvement in exomoon theory that we've had in a decade, and I'm really excited to see what they can do for us in the near future. Right under our noses, many of these Kepler TTV systems could really be genuine exomoons. We just need to figure out which ones are real and which ones are caused by planets instead. It's a thrilling time to work on exomoons. There's just so much we don't know. And we're literally figuring out the methodology right now. You know, sometimes students ask me whether the gold rush era of exoplanet discovery has passed. And maybe they wish they'd been born 20 years earlier so that they could have played a pivotal role in those early formative years of exoplanet discovery. And I don't know the answer to that. Maybe there is some truth to it. But for exomoons, we can say confidently that the gold rush era of exomoons is absolutely ahead of us and not behind. Exomoons will be a game-changing revolution. One that's been on the tip of our fingertips for the last decade, yet just out of reach. This is the time for not just my team, but for others too to join in and try out new ideas, searching with different techniques. It's through the variety of these ideas and human ingenuity that we will succeed. Infinite diversity in infinite combinations. So until next time, stay thoughtful and stay curious.